Lorne Armstrong, a man who has lived quite the life so far. He's only 36 years old, and his name is already associated with the scamming of an elderly couple, the attempt to date people 21 years younger than him, and his constant failings in regard to his love life. After making his way down to Nashville, Tennessee, to avoid the problems he created, you wonder to yourself, can it possibly get any worse? To figure this out, we're going to have to go back three years and discuss the man and the crew that would make a large name for themselves in mainstream culture. If you are in the Maine area, the state of Maine, never, ever, 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 ever hire this man to do any work for you. And i tell you why it bothers me is because of fucking a man to James. I still love, love them because they're my siblings. And- I will never let them get close to me again. Using the screen name Lorne A20014, he tells her how to masturbate and then asks her if she wants to see him naked. She agrees and he turns on his webcam. The year is 2004. The internet was still something a lot of people were trying to get the hang of. To date things even further, the Facebook was created this year in Cambridge, Massachusetts by Mark Zuckerberg and was only just a tool for college students to talk to one another. Because of how easy it was for anyone to just pick up a computer and because of the lack of security and moderations for websites and chat rooms back then. Grown adult men were easily able to find, talk to, and abuse children they met on the internet. This abuse didn't go unnoticed for much longer though, and the landscape would forever change for these degenerates once a show started airing on November 11th, 2004. This show was called To Catch a Predator, and it involved conducting undercover sting operations with a watchdog group called Perverted Justice to highlight and imprison pedophiles and child predators. The structure of each episode was fairly straightforward. Perverted Justice, an organization who conducts sting operations to lure in child predators online, did what they'd been doing since their creation in 2002. They created decoys, people that act like children but are actually full adults, to lure in men who wanted to chat and even have sex with them. Do you like having sex with 14-year-old girls? They could be your next-door neighbors. Do you like 14-year-old girls like that? Average guys. You told Cindy you wanted her to shower and shave before you got here. With tastes that are anything but. You wanted Cindy, the 13-year-old, waiting for you naked when you walked in? And with plenty of excuses, as you'll find in a minute. Sam, who are you looking for? Uh, I'm not really sure. You came for Dee Dee, didn't you? No. And in a few hours, we managed to find a handful of Atlanta area men looking to have sex with 13 or 14 year old girls. So, how'd we do it? Through the website pervertedjustice.com, a controversial vigilante cyber patrol made up entirely of volunteers posing in online chat rooms as underage girls and boys, just waiting for men like Ricky. Do you wish you hadn't done all this now? I wish I hadn't. Said decoys would engage in usually long conversation with the target, spanning over several days and months. Instead of doing what they usually do, which is just post the predator's conversation and notify their family members, employers, and neighbors of their online activities, Perverta Justice decoys were told to intentionally create meetups with the individual they've been talking to. The target, still believing that the person they've been talking to is still a child, agrees to the proposal and attempts to meet up with their alleged child. This is where the second half of the show, Dateline NBC, comes in. 
Dateline NBC is a television show that usually revolves around true crime stories. They had recently teamed up with Perverted Justice in order to properly conduct sting operations and help create the show we're discussing at this moment. We rent a house. Our people wire it with hidden cameras and microphones. Volunteers from the uh, online watchdog group Perverted Justice act as decoys, go into chat rooms with a profile that includes a picture that's unmistakably underage, and they sit and wait. And the next thing you know, the guy is knocking on our door, trying to have a sexual liaison with a 12, 13, or 14-year-old boy or girl. The house that the individual was supposed to arrive at wasn't a normal house anymore. This house was filled to the brim with hidden cameras and recording software, all provided by Dateline NBC. But of course, the target doesn't know that. They still think that they're meeting the child they've been talking to. More than a few sexual predators believe there's a minor waiting alone in this house, but they're in for a big surprise. We've got our hidden cameras rolling, so stick around and wait to see who knocks on our door. The target walks up to the decoy house, expecting the child to answer the door, and an actor who plays the role of a child greets the predator. The actor lures in the predator and asks them to take a seat. I was just watching some TV, come sit down. Uh. Once they finally sit down and got comfortable, a very tall and intimidating man named Chris Hansen, who was the charming host of the show, would walk into the room and start questioning the person about their intentions. How old were you? Uh, 22. 22. And how old was the girl you were chatting with? Uh, the girl said she was 13 or 14. 13 or 14. And you thought that it would be okay to come over here and visit a young girl home alone? I would never think it was okay. But I guess. Chris Hansen is an American television journalist and he didn't come unprepared. He had the entire chat log between the target and their fake child, as well as any photos they might have sent. Well Chuck, the only problem with that story is, is that I have the transcripts of your conversation with Luke. What are you looking for? I could be your grandpa. Into young boys your age, love to cuddle with them, caress their body, work my... And it goes on from there. Once they were done speaking to Chris, he would reveal to the men that this entire thing was a sting operation, and that they'll be exposed as a sexual predator to national TV. We were doing a story on computer predators. Now, if there's anything else you'd like to say, he knows that this is even worse than getting arrested. He knows that this is going to be on television. There were 12 investigations in total, and each location of a new investigation was its own episode. The first two investigations, conducted in Bethpage, Long Island, and Fairfax County, Virginia, didn't involve the cops. 18 men showed up in the first episode, and 19 appeared in the second one. Because of the lack of law enforcement, none of these men were arrested immediately, and not all of them had charges pressed on them. When it came to arrest, the Riverside California sting was compared to none, having caught 51 men in the span of three days. This and every subsequent episode following also involved law enforcement, so these predators aren't getting off so easily anymore. The fourth sting, Greenville, Ohio, was a test to see if child predators were also in small towns as they were in big cities. 17 men were arrested in this sting. 24 men would later be arrested at the next sting in Fort Myers, Florida. The Forts in Georgia sting would expose 20 more men, and a great number of them had relations to the US military due to its location. The seventh episode, Petaluma, California, saw and caught 29 men that day. This episode, for whatever reason, is regularly taken down from YouTube due to copyright infringement, more times compared to the other episodes. Episode 8, taking place in Long Beach, California, would be very significant to the area around it. 38 men were arrested in the sting, but they received less stricter sentences than the men previously on the show. That was because the judge was more sympathetic to the people caught. Whether you agree with his assessment or not, 
This caused the laws against adults targeting children online to be strengthened in California. Murphy, Texas, the next location of the show, would also be eventful, only for the wrong reasons though. Protests were held in front of the Sting House by local citizens because they believed that the show would attract more predators to their town instead of keeping them away. They were broken up quickly and the show continued as normal up until the arrest of Lewis Conrad. Lewis Conrad was an assistant district attorney and was going to be featured on the show because of his chat with an underage kid. Instead of baiting him out to a sting house though, they decided to arrest Lewis at his own house. Once the SWAT team approached Lewis's house, he would then take his own life. The first and only person to do so on the show. This one event would eventually lead to the cancellation of the show, as a lawsuit was placed on Dateline NBC for its handling of the event in 2007. What's even more tragic though, is that the 25 men that were apprehended in the sting had all of their charges dropped because of the incident, meaning no arrests were made. Three months, News 8 has been reporting on questions about the TV show to catch a predator and its sting in Murphy, Texas. Now NBC is being sued for $105 million for its role in the show. News 8's Byron Harris has our story tonight. This was the final sting in NBC's Murphy episode of To Catch a Predator. As Murphy and Terrell police entered this house with an erroneous search warrant, the man inside, an alleged internet sexual predator, killed himself. Bill Conrad was a former Kaufman County District Attorney. Now his sister, Patricia Conrad, is suing NBC for $105 million. The entertainment industry cannot act as police, judge, jury, executioner. And for a corporation like NBC, ratings and money matter. Despite the absolute mess that was episode 9 of the show, three more episodes were made after that one. Episode 10, The Flagler Beach, Florida Sting, caught 21 men, most of which drove long distances to see their child. Ocean County, New Jersey was the next sting and episode in the series. 28 men were arrested, one of which drove 6 hours to the sting house, which is the longest anyone has driven on the show. This is also the first episode featuring a decoy actress named Casey Monroe. Trust me, you're going to be hearing that name a lot, so commit it to memory. Episode 12 was Bowling Green, Kentucky. This episode was the final one in the To Catch a Predator series, and although 29 men were caught in the entire four day sting, only 7 were caught in Bowling Green, Kentucky for the show. Because of how little predators there were, they all got large amounts of screen time compared to the other predators on previous episodes, which made for some very memorable quotes. Despite ending abruptly due to the suicide of Lewis, the show was very successful and incredibly entertaining. Many criticisms were slung at the now cancelled show, like how a lot of the cases could be considered entrapment, or law enforcement making a person commit a crime they wouldn't normally do on their own. Another criticism is that the show has been said to make news instead of reporting news, as they blur the line between being NBC the news organization versus an agency of law enforcement. Of course, while looking at all of the criticism, you can't ignore the overwhelming good that the show has brought. It caught many dangerous men and men who had child victims in the past. It has strengthened the laws involving adults targeting children online in California. And while doing all of that, it managed to be so entertaining and memorable that now Chris Hansen and the show are synonymous with sting operations and catching child predators online. The show had one task, and it did it without fail. Show the world what monsters truly lurk on the internet. show you just how dangerous it can be to let your child surf the web alone. How easily can it happen? We found out in a Dateline hidden camera investigation. We want to warn you, some of what you're about to see and hear tonight is explicit. Here's Chris Hansen. Are these chat rooms really that creepy? Enter a group called Perverted Justice. 
you thought it was a good idea to come visit a 13-year-old girl for what reason? Just to hang out. Just a lonely guy. I have been in television for 24 years. We'll see. Hello. Um, here to see Brandon. What's up? Oh, dang. Don't touch anybody. You gotta stop this. I just came to get something to eat. He was here to have a date with a 13-year-old. Absolutely curiosity that got me. Father, son. Father, son. Cuddling and caressing. He had walked. He had gotten on a bus. He had walked some more. I had a feeling this was what was going on, honestly. Why did you bring the condoms? Because it was dumb. You're going to give any to the 15 year Oh, no, 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 no. It's a question. The internet and real life are two different things. Do I want my cookies? Dr. Chip's my favorite. Double cheeseburgers with no pickles. It helps show intent. I got two words for NBC. Role playing chat room, I. There's a potential of fulfilling this fantasy I have. Actually, I want you to come here. Looks like you brought enough stuff to move in. Why don't you have a seat right over there, please? Why don't you have a seat right over there, please? It has been more than two years now since we first began our series of reports investigating online sex predators. Five different states, 129 men exposed. Once again, even men who have seen our reports show up at the door. We should let you know that some of what you will see and hear is explicit. Here's Chris Hansen. Warwicker responds. This is punk, right? Yeah. Please leave me alone. Do not message me. What does she keep doing? She keeps messaging me. What's wrong? I'm sorry. Please have a seat. I'm sorry. How old are you? I'm old. My best friend's mom is dying of cancer. Love to suck play and suck play with like and said, lick nipples and lick and and you. What, where is that in the Bible? Online, Wiles uses the screen name Hamburger. Safraz Khan. Tennis boy, this is uh, Slave to Mistresses. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC. Why do you think I'm just as stunned as you are, Hat? Oh, you're stunned because you got caught. And here's the surprise. She a driving. I'm not a driver at night. And what about visiting a boy who's home alone? Does that make you nervous? You can put that in the fridge. In a few minutes, our next potential predator will probably be thinking he too should have stayed away. Okay, his name is Lorne, L-O-R, and he, you're Kayla. He's 37-year-old Lorne Armstrong, a construction worker. He's been chatting with a girl posing as a 13-year-old for more than a month. It's one of the longest chat logs we've ever seen. We last left Lauren Armstrong in Nashville, Tennessee in the summer of 2007. After being overwhelmed by Betty, who rightfully wants her money back, Lauren decided to skip town and make a new life for himself in Nashville. The first thing he did was grab himself a job, mainly because even after he left Nashville, Betty was still looking for him. She got into contact with Lauren and Lauren cried to her, saying that he'll pay her back once he gets settled down in Nashville. We were looking for him, but the fellow down the street told us that he had moved to Nashville. That's the first way we first heard it. And we did get a phone call from him, and he was crying. Of I know course. It's hard to believe. Yeah. But he was crying, and he said, As soon as I get myself situated, I'm going to start sending you $100. Well, you know why that was? It was because he had talked to Mr. McKinnon from DA's office, so naturally, He's going to try to make it look like he's going to make good on restitution. Right. But, of course, that never happened. You never saw any money. Never saw a dime. Lauren actually did get himself a job in Nashville. Two, in fact. But let's only discuss the first one right now. Between the months of September and October of 2007, Lauren was employed by Century 2, and according to him... The company gathered donations for the fire department, and he held a full-time position at said company. This is a very interesting statement considering the fact that a representative at Century 2 said that Lauren never actually worked there, but hey, a job is a job I guess. Instead of paying back Betty with his new job though, Lauren started to look for more people to talk to online. We all remember how well that went last time he did such a thing, so why not give it another shot? On September 17, 2007, 
Lauren would try to message four people, all of which were perverted justice decoys. Kimmy Kimmy Goko Bop, Disney Girl 13, and TT Tia Pet 13 were three of the decoys Lauren would message, but their conversation wouldn't last that long. The fourth decoy Lauren messaged, Kayla Princess 94, also known as Kayla, would be the one that he attached to and started talking to on a daily basis. Now let's do a little bit of analyzing to see what Lauren got up to in these chat logs. On September 17th, 2007 at 9.22 p.m., Lauren sent the first message to Kayla under the username LaurenA20014. He then proceeded to mention his nieces, talk about his dogs, and tell Kayla to not talk to weirdos on the internet who want to look for her. An hour and 22 minutes later at 10.44 p.m., Lauren had already mentioned to Kayla that she might have a crush on him and asked how many guys she's kissed. 32 minutes from that, Lauren starts describing how people have sex. So, in short, it took Lauren an hour and 54 minutes to start talking sexually to a 13-year-old girl. To give even more context, I think it's best to just read what the professionals have to say. Between September 17th and October 18th of 2007, Lauren Lynn Armstrong engaged in online chatting with Kayla Princess 94, a person he believed to be a 13-year-old minor. However, this person was actually a participant in the Kentucky Bureau of Investigation undercover sting operation, whose goal was to expose online sexual predators. A portion of the online chats between Armstrong and Kayla were of explicit sexual nature and contained discussions of oral, vaginal, and anal sex. There were over 400 pages of printed chat material between Armstrong and Kayla that occurred during the time of this offense. In addition to being extensive, the chats involved graphic discussions between Armstrong and Kayla. A review of the chat material reveals Armstrong instructed Kayla on how to delete evidence of their chats so her parents would not be able to see they had been communicating, encouraged her to buy a prepaid telephone card so they could speak on the telephone without the calls showing up on her parents' telephone bill, and he taught her how to masturbate. During this time period, Armstrong, in addition to chatting, transmitted several nude images of himself to Kayla using a webcam. These images included him just walking around naked as well as very close screenshots of his genitals. In his chats, Armstrong would ask Kayla if she would like to touch him and explain how she can cause white stuff to come out of him. Armstrong additionally cautioned Kayla about giving out his information in her chats and told her there were people on the internet who were not nice and or did not have good intentions. Quite disgusting stuff, but remember, this is all a sting operation. Kayla is completely fake, and the goal is to catch the predator. So Lauren and Kayla planned on meeting at her house, giving the excuse that Kayla's parents were luckily out of town. October 18th, 2007 was the date they planned, which also happened to be Lauren's birthday, which is even better. So Lauren took a shower, brought a bracelet for Kayla, brought some condoms for sex like they talked about in the chat, and drove from Nashville, Tennessee all the way to Bowling Green, Kentucky where Kayla was located. Once arriving at the house after an hour and a half of driving, Lauren spoke to who he thought was Kayla, but was instead an actress named Casey Monroe, who has been paid to pretend she is Kayla. Lauren walked in sat down, really took his time to feel out his environment and talk to Kayla. I thought you had blonde hair. Do you like it? I dyed it for I think, myself. I think it's pretty. Thank you. It's very pretty. Did you bring any condoms? Yes, I did. Where are they? Out in the truck. Well, what good are they going to do in the truck if we're in here? <laughs> well, yell at me, why don't you? <laughs> are you nervous? <laughs> A little bit. A little bit? Not as bad as you thought you would be? <laughs> I like seeing you in person. Yeah, I like seeing you too. After Lauren and Kayla's back and forth, the host, Chris Hansen, revealed himself and started asking Lauren questions pertaining to why he came so long to talk to a little girl. You're a pretty prolific chatter there. You want to explain yourself? Not really. I never really was going to do anything. You weren't really going to do anything? No. So you brought condoms. What else did you bring? I brought her a bracelet. And she is how old? She's supposed to be 13. And how old are you? 37. Getting married, she's 13. 
So I met when she was 18. Well, you were going to marry her when she turned 18. What do you think ought to happen to you? I think I should go to counseling to get off the internet. I got to do something that I can't do that. <laughs> Let go on. After their discussion, Chris told Lauren that this entire thing was a sting operation and that he'll be on national TV. There's something I got to tell you. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC and we're doing a story on the oh. Lauren, ashamed of what he had become, quickly left the room, only to be greeted by the cold, hard ground and arrested soon after. Breaking rocks out here on a chain gun. Breaking rocks, I'm serving my time. Breaking rocks out here on a chain gun. Cause the crowd convicted me of crime. Hold it steady right there while I hit it. Lauren was incarcerated on the same night he was arrested, and he didn't make bail. Housed at Warren County Jail, he was charged with traveling in interstate commerce to engage in illicit sexual conduct. He took a plea bargain to lessen his charges as he was facing up to 30 years for the intent to make child porn. The reason the court could have gotten him on this was because in his truck, the police found a camera. And in the chat log, Lauren references the idea of taking photos. Lauren pleaded guilty to the charges on March 31st, 2008, was sentenced to 60 months for his federal charge on June 30th, 2008, and then sentenced to seven years for his state charge on August 18th, 2008. He first was housed at the Luther Luckett Correctional Complex in Kentucky for his state sentence, but was given parole and was able to not serve all seven years of his sentence. He did however have to serve out his federal sentence and was transferred to Fort Dix in New Jersey to serve another 15 months of prison time in 2011. The reason it was only 15 months however was because he served his federal sentence concurrently with his state sentence. With all that taken into account, Lorne spent the next five years, two weeks, and five days behind bars. As you may have noticed by the way, this event was the reason why Lorne basically disappeared from our three stories in the last episode. Let's do a little bit of catch up, shall we? December 28th, 2007 was when the episode of To Catch a Predator featuring Lorne would air on national TV. The fellow inmates in Lorne's jail saw the broadcast. MySpace Girl Number 1 saw the broadcast and called Tony to talk about it with him. He was busy at the time and basically told her that there was nothing they could really do. Luckily, she and Lorne would never speak to each other again. Well, when I got caught up, in the sting, sorry, and she called Tony. Oh, told she Tony saw it on TV. Yeah, she told Tony she okay. was in trouble. And Tony said, "Yeah, nothing we can do about it. Anything else that was said, I don't know. I don't think the conversation was very long because Tony had companies at the time." He said, "Oh, okay. Did you ever talk to her after that? No, because you went to prison, so that yeah. would make sense, right? Prison. Okay. Did I ever wish? Um, that I did? Yeah, I, I wish that I did because." You know, and I had a really good friendship. We really, okay. We grew to love each other in a friendship way because we okay. had talked so much and shared so much with each other. Okay. She had, she was going through quite a tough time. When mm -hmm. She was a kid when she was, when she was 15, 16, started getting a little better when she was 17. Then 18, she was, when she graduated, she was, after she graduated, she was going to come out of Nashville. Okay. So, when you were talking to Kayla, you were talking to her at the same time? Well, when I was talking, yeah, I, I was talking to some. I wasn't talking to her very much, though. But there was still a plan yeah. for her to come down and be with you? No, not be with me, to visit with me. Okay. But as far as being there, there was no plans for us to be boyfriend and girlfriend. She was going to come down and visit me. 
So whatever happens, happens. As for Lauren's employment status, Lauren eventually quit his job at Century 2 and got one last job between October 15th and October 23rd of 2007, right before he got caught. He worked at Trades Unlimited and only worked there for one week. Last but certainly not least is Betty. She didn't have the best internet, but was able to see the episode as well. I'll let her tell you what happened next. So after all that went down, uh, the, the the bit about him on the show, and now you know where he's at, and, and he's in jail, and, and you guys wrote him a letter. Is that right? Yes. And, and the letter had content which stated, you know, you really caused us a lot of problems. You, a, a whole lot of problems. <laughs> A whole lot. Well done. Because, yeah. So uh, the letter, the content said, you know, you you have caused this world of grief, and um, and I did add into the letter. Well, Lauren, you decided you weren't going to pay us back, and you thought you were going to walk away free, but look what happened. Mm-hmm. Karma, karma got you. Mm-hmm. Karma got you, and. He wrote back and his letter said, Eric and Betty, just to let you know, yeah, I got your letter. Mm. That was it. Unbelievable. And have him since. Lauren's rampage had finally stopped and he was finally behind bars. Of course, as we all know, the grind never stops. Lauren didn't just sit in prison and mope around for five years. He decided to keep himself occupied with various activities. He learned how to play guitar. He worked out. He wrote a book called Taken Abroad, which tells the story of a man named Aaron who, after having a traumatic past from being in the military, tries to settle down and live a good life. It's not really the best book, but hey, I've never read it, so maybe it's a hidden gem. Lauren also did a lot of reading as well. He really wanted to become acquainted with the law since he felt like he was incorrectly treated, so he spent his time studying. Finally, Lauren decided to log his experiences in prison via his prison journal. And this is where things get very interesting, because this is when reality starts to shift and the events that took place prior to Lauren's arrest starts to be rewritten. The moment where it just isn't a sting operation, and it isn't just a chat log, but a scheme propped up by a broken system. The moment where it changes from the events that occurred and the facts of the case to Lauren Armstrong versus the world. Lauren's enemies are made very clear in this journal. Dateline NBC and Perverted Justice have taken advantage of him, and he didn't take too kindly to that. He wasn't victimizing other people, he himself was the victim. And that's what's so fascinating. That's what inclines so many people to keep up with this guy. It's the insane lengths he'll go just to make sure that he doesn't take responsibility for what he has done. The lies he created to make sure he remains somewhat virtuous when in fact he's the lowest of the low. An attempt to reveal the corrupt system he was screwed over by, while ignoring the people he himself had screwed over. Lauren felt so justified in his thoughts that he even filed a lawsuit against NBC while in jail. Let's read a little bit from that lawsuit. The United States continuously mentions the condoms, the camera, and the gift that I had brought to the Stinghouse. This is the first time I'm responding to that. The condoms were in my truck because I used to go to karaoke bars in Nashville a lot because my dream was to make it in country music. I would be ignorant to not have condoms when going to bars. The camera was in my truck because I tried to pawn it at three different pawn shops in Nashville, Tennessee on Nolensville Pike. None of them would take it because of the duct tape on the back that was there to hold the cover in place. I had told the federal investigator that that was initially working on my case with my first federal lawyer, but he never bothered to do any investigating. 
even when the United States threatened me that they would add attempted production of child pornography, which adds up to 30 years if I didn't accept the plea agreement that was offered. As for the gift, excuse my language to the court, but the gift was crap. They, meaning NBC and their employees perverted justice, had asked me to bring a gift. The United States also states in a roundabout way that my mental state of mind was fine. If my mental state of mind was fine, then I would never have given away three truckloads of tools and sold my house for $8,000 after having over $60,000 into it and moved away where I had no family to finally, at the age of 36, pursue my childhood dream. I also never would have been diagnosed with depression a short time after being in jail. My original lawyer would have known about that had he ever bothered to check. Even after I told him about that, the jail psychiatrist put me on Prozac for depression. This little section I just read, by the way, is part of a letter that Warren sent in 2015 to continue fighting in his lawsuit. So even after being in prison for five years, Lauren still has the mindset that he was the victim in all of this. He was set up all along, he'll keep saying. The whole system is corrupt, he'll tell you. He did all of this just to run away from the crime he committed and from the undeniable truth. I had no intention of ever being anything to this girl except for someone who warned her about the dangers of the internet and then leave her alone. Perverted Justice kept talking and found that I was vulnerable because of the things I'd been going through, so they played on that and got me to talk sexual to the girl and talked me into coming to Bowling Green, Kentucky to her house after I told them no several different times. Perverted Justice had used guilt trips and anything they could to get me to finally come to this house in Bowling Green, Kentucky. They'd even sent me 11 or 12 pictures that weren't even of the same girl. I couldn't see it at the time even though it was very plain to see that the pictures were of different girls. The only thing that I was able to see was that someone was giving me attention that had to do with me. But they kept on him until he gave in. Chris Hansen says that they simply afford people the opportunity. That's nothing but a load of cow manure coming from a mouth that gets paid to lie. What they do is they find people that are vulnerable and talk them into committing crimes so that they can make a television show and bring in a paycheck. I've received 60 months from the feds for a sentence at 85% and 7 years from the state of Kentucky for a sentence at 20%. I now have to register as a sex offender for life with the feds and be on supervised release for at least 2 years after my 60 months of incarceration and for the state, I have to register as a sex offender for 20 years after my release and be on probation for 5 years. As far as me getting 60 months for a sentence from the feds, that's nothing but a crack of crap too. I told my federal appointed defender's investigator that the pawn shop I was in to pawn the camera had video cameras, and that could prove that I was in the pawn shop with the camera. The guy just shrugged it off without trying. I figured with a defense team like that, I would be safer to plead guilty and take the 60 month offer rather than take my chances at losing 15 years of my life because of the poor defender I had and the disgusting accusation from the prosecution. I am in no means rejecting responsibility on my part. I allowed myself to be talked into attempting to do this disgusting crime that should actually be considered entrapment. What I'm saying is that if MSNBC Dateline is going to do such a show as this, then they and their affiliates, Perverted Justice, need to be sure that they're catching actual predators, not taking advantage of someone's mental or emotional state of mind and talking them into doing something they wouldn't normally do simply to help their ratings for a television show and to help put money in their pockets. If someone is an actual predator, they'll be out there looking for it. They won't have to be talked into doing this crime. What's even worse is that the United States government would allow a major television network to do such a thing and not have rules and regulations set up for such a thing. I like seeing justice done too, but I like seeing honest justice, not paycheck and ratings justice.
While Lorne was writing his Elliot Roger-like manifesto in prison, something was brewing in the background. You see, as things get popular, they tend to attract fans that enjoy discussing that said thing, and this was no different for TCAP. After the last episode of the show aired in 2007, a small community started to form, made up of people who enjoyed said show. YouTube channels were created, and on these channels, people would react to the individuals that appeared on the show, or just post memes about them. Are you still there, sir? Yeah. Okay, that's a little better. Oh, okay. Okay. So, what can I help you out with? Um, what are you up to today? Today, I'm uh, just helping out customers on the phone, just uh, making sure I can make uh, everyone stay a little bit better. Oh, okay. We were talking about me being down there around 7. Uh, um, are, are you trying to call Best Buy, sir? Yeah. Yeah? Um, what what were you uh, coming in for a 7 for? Um, see, because I'm going to be down there around 7 or so. See, it all depends on when I can get out of here. I mean, you realize that. So, you know, it may be okay. it may be a little bit later, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. I, I, <laughs> after, you know, it was last night, you know, I was laying in bed, and I was like, oh, you know, oh, man, you know, I could get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's no, no worries. Oh, okay. Okay, sounds good. All right, anything else I could help you out with? No. All right, well, you have a good one. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Lorne, being one of these predators, got a pretty decent amount of attention from this new TCAP community because of how pathetic he looked in his encounter with Chris Hansen, as well as his over 400-page chat log. This little TCAP community grew larger and larger as the years went by, and the discussion of Lauren started to pique many people's interest, especially since Lauren was scheduled to be released from jail in 2012. Don't worry, we'll cover that in a bit, but let's stick with this community for a little longer. After Lauren's release, the increase of Lauren followers grew insanely larger, to the point where people now dedicated full YouTube channels just for talking about Lauren. This is where we start to follow a man named Bay Shaman, a person who started making content in early 2015. His content mainly focused on many different predators on TCAP, giving commentary over certain episodes and reading the predators chat logs. One day, Bay Shaman stumbled upon the Church of Cod, an incredibly small group of people who were only talking about Lorne, and did said talking mainly in comment sections on videos. Becoming interested with this group, Bay Shaman joined them. Fast forward a couple of years, BOOM! I find to catch predator shit all over YouTube. I watch Rascal's Lauren video. I completely remembered Lauren from the uh, Bowling Green investigation. I then watched Sam Pendleton's video, I loved her first, and I was inspired to make one just like it. I uploaded it in 2012, deleted it in 2014. Why didn't I keep it up? I'm an idiot. In March of 2015, I saw John Pedersen commenting on Sam's video, talking with Judas Priest and Lance Top. John mentions the Church of Cod, I ask if I can join, and they accept me. There were only a couple of people at this time who were in on it, and it was really more of a little inside joke between them. Unbeknownst to the small group, Bay Shaman would take this idea and completely blow it up. Then, I fucked it all up, when I started making shit like this. We already sleep on the fucking floor! I'm Reverend Shaman. You must spread the word of my son, Lord Armstrong. Bay Shaman started making videos about Lorne and ran this Church of Cod idea to the point where it became almost like a real religion. Members were coming in left and right, commenting and discussing Lorne in the comment sections on Bay Shaman's videos. Others started gearing their content towards Lorne and soon the comment section couldn't contain this religion. They expanded to a Facebook page, properly titled The Church of Cod. Terminology started to form from this group to properly describe them. The people who made content on Lorne were now called Holy Lornographers. Lorne's 400 page chat log with Kayla was now called the Holy Lornography. Even the name, the Church of Cod, 
is a parody of the Church of God, but reworked to fit Lauren's heavy New England accent. Of course, it was all completely jokes and laughs, and they weren't actually praising a sex offender like a god. The people did find Lorne quite interesting. He stood out from the crowd of weirdos, and for obvious reasons. A religion based upon a pedophile. It sounds completely crazy, but it worked, and it worked really well. Popes, priests, reverence, and at the top of it all, only one true god. Well, uh, my name is Base Shaman. I'm a YouTuber. I make videos. I used to focus specifically on Lauren Armstrong, but over time I've sort of expanded and uh, I make fun of a lot of different guys who got caught on the show called To Catch a Predator. Um, I make all kinds of crazy, crazy videos about them. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically what they know me for. That's what I do every day for fun. Dude, I started watching when I was in high school. I was about 16 or 17, and that's when my parents showed it to me. They're like, you gotta see this, look at this, and they showed me. They're like, look at these guys. They're like, don't ever be in this situation. And I was like, all right, I won't, I won't. And uh, how did I get into Lorne? Well, you know, years later, I was watching it on YouTube, and next thing you know, I just see, uh, I see this video with Lorne on it. And I remembered who he was from the show, but I never knew his name or anything. And then I really got into him, and I was like, this is fascinating. He's crying. He's, he's, he's his heart broken. And that's how I got into making the videos about Lorne. He's just, he's just a sad, sad tale of a deranged guy. It's November 6, 2012. Lorne walked out of Fort Dix to a bright sunny day. The first thing he does? Buys a pack of cigarettes. And his first meal out? His mother's good old chicken pot pie. Now, you would think that the people who were into TCAP, as well as the people who were really into Lorne, would be acknowledged by Lorne after he got out of jail. But it would actually take three years for Lorne to interact with them due to the fact that the Church of Cod wouldn't be prominent until Bay Shaman's arrival in 2015. Even if there was a Church of Cod, Lorne wouldn't be able to interact with them because he was now placed on probation and had limited access to the internet. So what did Lorne do up until 2015? Firstly, he filed another lawsuit. Yes, another one. The first one, which he filed while in prison, was terminated in 2012, so he just filed another one. He also went back to dating, not online dating, but he did start to look for women around his area. You would think that he'd be a little bit shell-shocked, but nope, not Lorne. In the span of three years, Lorne would go out and meet various women, and just like Amanda James and Paula, we know very, very little about them, almost like they don't even exist. Lorne has mentioned interest in many different girls between this time period, like Sierra, Chelsea, Denise, Jen, and Vanessa Ann Lee Parker, all women that Lorne supposedly met while they were working, but there was one girl that Lorne would actually get with. Oh, Nikki. A very short but sweet saga. Nikki was a 21 year old girl Lauren met around 2013. After getting to know about her and her situation, Lauren took out a $9,000 loan to help Nikki pay for an apartment and furniture, but didn't get a real relationship out of it. And that's all I have for that one. One of them I spoke to recently, and her recollection of events with Lauren was much different than what Lauren said. What Lauren said was that this girl scammed him, that this girl had a, a couple of kids and needed to get out of her living situation because she lived near a bunch of drug addicts and they were going to take her kids away. So he gave her money to get a new apartment. Um, now, he says he never had a physical relationship with her. He said they dated, but they never had a physical relationship. And he said that she came over for a barbecue at his mother's house and met his mother. And he gave her $10,000 and that she scammed him. 
Um, so anyway, we talked to this girl that he supposedly had a relationship with. She was 21 at the time, and he was 41 or 42. So he was twice her age, and they met in a bar. And she says that she immediately told him that she had a fiancé and wanted nothing to do with him. And he became a stalker and would call her work and ask people that knew her questions about her. And finally, her boyfriend had to set him straight, and she had to get a uh, restraining order. He also, She also says that another woman that she knew went through the same situation where this woman was sitting outside of a gas station. I think she worked in a convenience store with a gas station. She was sitting out there smoking a cigarette, and Lauren came over and said hi, and she said hi back. And immediately that woman became Lauren's girlfriend. Before we move on, I think it would be nice to read a report describing a situation involving Nikki. Examined Lauren's cell phone, discovered 38 phone calls made to the entity entitled Mom Inn in his address book. These 38 calls occurred between 2.30 p.m. and 9 o'clock p.m. this date, the date being September 15, 2015. Multiple unanswered text messages also discovered approximately six unanswered to. At least one of these text messages was accusatory in nature, stating something to the effect of, I know you have the ringer off so whoever you are with doesn't hear it. Many of the texts contained profanity. Lauren reported that Mom N was Nikki, the same woman which he was previously involved with and who subsequently filed a harassment complaint against him. A further review of other text messages revealed that there have been what appears to be consensual communication between the two. However, the number of texts that Lauren sent vastly outnumbered the number received in both quantity and content. Lauren reported that he and Nikki are now dating, but they had not kissed yet, or become sexual. I inquired as to if Nikki was aware of this relationship status, did not receive a definitive answer. Lauren was apparently upset because it isn't like her to not respond like this, and that is why he had called 38 times. Lauren stated he had heard of a fatal traffic accident in Bar Harbor and that it was a black car, and that he believed Nikki knew someone with a black car. Lauren acknowledged that he also knew several people with black cars and that it was very likely that most people know several people with black cars. Lauren also acknowledged that it would be highly unusual for Nikki to have taken a day dip to Bar Harbor midweek without any prior planning. At this point, Lauren became quite upset, raising his voice and expressing his feelings of resentment that he has to explain his relationships to anyone. Lauren also continued to voice his opposition to the sex offender registry requirement. Lauren and I walked through his status on supervision and the requirements and duties of my job. Lauren then began his well-rehearsed tirade against NBC, Chris Hansen, and perverted justice. Attempts to have Lauren acknowledge his culpability in his conduct were not successful, but I was able to de-escalate him to an appropriate level. Lauren and I discussed further what his ideals of healthy and respectful relationships look like, which led to him revisiting his family issues and the ways he has been wronged by family members. Lauren also provided me with a copy of chapter 1 of his latest book, which appears to be a manifesto ranting against the justice system. This tells us a massive amount about Lauren in this situation. Firstly, we now know that Nikki is actually real. When Lauren discusses his previous relationships, it could be believed that he is either omitting things on purpose or just making it all up due to how vague the stories are. We know that Nikki is not only real, but they barely had a relationship. We know that Lauren is overly obsessive to the point where he now has a restraining order placed on him. And most importantly, we know that Lauren is upset about his probation and that he still holds a grudge against the people who jailed him. And then there was Vanessa. Then there was Vanessa. Vanessa was 21 or 22. I think she was 22 when I met her. And how did you meet her? Um, I think that was two years ago. Okay. 
So you were slaying all the ladies in the country music room. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess I was. <laughs> yeah. Vanessa had even talked to mom and, and mom's friend Mel. Okay. She told us right. some different time. She even told mom and Mel that, that she would be up. Yeah. She never showed up. Uh, that, that crushed me. Yeah. Well, you so, said that she was from New York, but she had a West Virginia phone number. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, All right. That crushed me I really had feelings for her. Mm -hmm. I, talked her I talked to her a lot on the phone. and mm -hmm. it was, That was a tough one. Yeah. Before her, I had never spent that much time on the phone with anyone. Oh, okay. So that's where your addiction started. Yeah, in, in, including uh, <laughs> including Amanda James. Okay. I never spent that much time on the phone with her. Yeah. So most most of the time that we were on the phone, we well, she called me while I was working, and we thought maybe you know, maybe a half hour then, but that would be it. Yeah, the rest of the time was on Mr. Messenger. And, okay. Yeah. All right. So with Vanessa, that kind of sparked your interest in talking on the phone all the time. Yeah, I guess it did. Okay. Huh. Did you ever ask her why she never decided to meet you, or did she just disappear? No, I, I asked her why. I don't remember what her reason was. Was it because she had a tiger to feed? Yeah, it must have been. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. All right, now back to the cult following that is the Church of Cod. Quite a bit has changed since their creation in mid-2015. Bass Shaman continued to promote the Church of Cod in his entertaining videos, and this group kept getting more and more members. Now instead of just Bass Shaman as our leading pornographer, many creators joined the fun and became large in this community. Nathaniel Trevor and Ember Inferno are the two we'll be focusing on though, as they paved the path for the future of this community. Nathaniel Trevor was someone who would make your typical Lauren analysis videos. Yo, what's up YouTube? Welcome to my new videos, 10 reasons to be afraid of Lorne. You won't believe number 7. Number 10, he's alive. As long as he's alive, he can rape a kid. Number 9, he's still breeding and thus he can live. Number 8, he has a job, so now he has money to chat on people. Number 7, he has a car. Well, I'm not sure if he has one, but uh, you know, it's the middle part of the article and nobody's gonna listen to the video that long. Number 6, he still has fingers, so he can still type on the computer. Number 6, he still has a dick i don't know why we didn't castrate him which means the number four he still has dolls and that's not a good thing with pedophile number three he still lives in the same dimension as us uh we should have banned it you know in another dimension with our demons like we should have sent him back to hell but we didn't number two and now we go to the finally why should we be afraid of Lauren? because knowing he doesn't regret what he did that's horrible. One is a predator. Number one, I have Tyson Unless He's Armstrong. Have a good night. And that's a minute. I just under a minute. So I hope you're right. And Ember was someone who would make memes and music parodies of Lauren and other predators that appeared on TCAP. Lauren Armstrong drove here from far away to meet a girl named Kayla. But something about him made me say, Casey. You know you like your dicks a little bit short. I should also mention that Betty, or Durango Mango Online, also joined in on the online antics. Let's do some catching up with her. Around December of 2011, Betty's husband sadly passed away, and soon after, she found herself interacting with the Church of Cod community as they were very welcoming. In October of 2015, she released the Book of Durango, which is a book detailing the events of Lauren's big scam on her. And on March 10th, 2016, she had her legendary interview with Pope Pendleton that really shined a light on everything. Because today we're visiting with our dear friend Betty, better known to many of us as Durango Mango. Um, I wish there were a happier story to tell about how we've come to know her and her association with Lauren, but the reality is that she, like many others, um, was a victim of Lauren's 
selfish, manipulative wrongdoing. So as we visit with her here today, I want every listener to keep that in mind. If you've ever questioned why people are so interested in keeping Lauren's legacy alive, this is why. And if you're listening to this because you have some potential dealings with Lauren and you want to know what kind of person he is or what kind of worker he is or what kind of businessman he is, we're going to answer that question today. So, Betty, I want to thank you for being with us today. And on behalf of the entire church, we're honored to spend a little time with you. And we all thank you for being so open with us about your experiences. Um, We know some of these things aren't easy to talk about. And so we want you to know that you're among friends. So let's start at the beginning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us about Betty. The community even got so big that Warren was now aware of its presence. Well, kinda. He got a few letters from some community members, but either assumed that it was perverted justice or just thought that someone was playing a joke on him. So he ignored these letters talking about the Church of Cod. How did you first find out about the Church of Cod? Um, I first found out about from a letter I received from Korea. Okay. And then I was contacted by a person that acted normal, which was Ember. And she told me it was a real thing on the internet. Uh, there was a couple other people that acted uh, basically normal, and sent some decent letters. Uh, there were some other letters just were just completely ignorant. So uh, there was no way I would reply to them. People in any way, even though they asked me to reply to them. Everything was going just lovely for this religion or this cult. I really can't tell the difference anymore. But one problem that sometimes infests locale oriented communities is the need for new content. So how does the big three solve this issue? For Bass Shaman, he just stuck to making his meme videos, putting on a mask and pretending to be Lorne. He isn't really involved in the events coming up. For Nathaniel Trevor, he decided to expand on the Church of Cod Facebook page and made a Church of Cod website. And with the inclusion of a forum, all Lornographers can go there and discuss Lorne. Finally, there's Ember Inferno, who thought outside of the box. She decided to contact Lorne herself. It was always seen as wrong to contact Lauren since it could be quite dangerous, but Ember paid no mind to these warnings. She sent a letter to Lauren around early 2016, containing a shirt, some Oreos, and her number. Lauren, having nothing to do, called the number and spoke to Ember, who now called herself Emma to slightly hide her identity. Surprisingly, Lauren actually wasn't as dangerous as people presumed him to be. In fact, he was quite nice and happy to talk to Ember. Hi. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I hope you don't see this as a big imposition. Thank you so much for, um, you I, know, giving me time. I don't see it as any imposition. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> I, I, see it very, I see it as very nice. Ember would then speak to Lauren on a number of occasions gaining his trust by telling him that she's an advocate for him, that she believes that Lorne was screwed over, and that she wanted to help him in whatever problems he has. Lorne, of course, ate this up. He desperately needed someone to be on his side in his fight against NBC and perverted justice. In the process of doing things, I'm well, right now I'm concentrating more on getting my Thing, the whole thing back in court mm. but it, it, and plus I'm trying to get through this sex offender treatment class and and try to get off probation but I can't get off probation until I get myself back in court it, it's my pleasure it's my pleasure to, to explain it to people that want to know about it because uh, you know the way that I've been put out there it's, has ruined me a lot and it's taken a lot for me to get back to where I am now. And uh, for me to keep fighting, it takes people like you to make me realize this is why I'm still fighting. Yeah. Because there's things people don't know. And I'd, I'd not be damned if I want to 
die having people think this way about me. Plus, Ember is one of the most well-known creators in the community at the moment, so he now has a direct line to his cult. He can learn more about the people who obsess over him and can monitor any suspicious activity that might occur. We can literally see this in effect in the second call between Lauren and Ember, where Ember helps Lauren report a fake account of him on Facebook after crying like a child. The, the personal Facebook page that somebody made up, Lauren Armstrong. Yes. He said something about you said you could get that removed as fraud. No, I that you do can you, have it. Do recorded. you know how to do it? Yeah, and I and I want you to do this, how, and I want him it, to do this. Let me how, tell you how. Hi, I reported it as fraud, Lauren. I told you about um, it. I didn't. That's I, not me. I, I want I want to talk to you. Either my stepmother hit the button or I did. I, I fucking wanted to talk to you. If you're looking on there and you can see it, Lauren, you can see Give that that's minute. not me. Give me a minute, okay? I'm trying not to break down. Okay. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Talk to my mother for a minute. I got I to try to gather myself. Yeah, Lauren, please. After Lauren freaked out on Ember this one time, Ember decided not to waste this golden opportunity and started to record the conversations she and Lauren would have. After recording these calls, Ember would then share them with Nathaniel, who then got drunk one day and gave the calls to someone else who then released them out to the public soon after. Ember would also start streaming herself calling Lauren on YouTube and re-uploads of said streams would appear after the fact. The community absolutely loved what they heard, and this started not only a legacy, but a drive for more Lorne content. Alright, the next events are about to get a little bit wonky. Ember kept talking to Lorne, and this led to both Ember, Nathaniel, and other community members attempting to conduct several interviews with Lorne. One of these interviews was funded by donations. A bunch of community members would raise upwards to $5,000 for this interview to happen. Half of the money would go to Betty and the other half would go to Lorne. This interview was canceled shortly after for various reasons, but Nathaniel refused to give back the donated money. The interview ended up being resurrected by Ember, and Nathaniel was given no credit for helping. In that interview, by the way, Lorne addressed Betty, talked about his first experiences in Nashville, and his disdain towards perverted justice. So how'd you feel about that? I mean, you, and, so, I don't mean to cut you off, but you know, you, you leave Maine with this, you know, the deposit retainer, whatever you want to call it from Betty, but you, you know, you leave to start a new life in Matt, Nashville with that money. I mean, what's, what's going through your head at that point? I, I felt like shit. Literally. I, I literally felt like shit because I know I, I knew I had her money. But the only thing that I could think was in order to get people to stop using me, I had to leave. And I didn't so I sold my house for $8,000 after I had over $60,000 into it and got rid of a lot of things, basically for free. And I took my dog and loaded as much stuff in my truck as I could and I went down to Nashville. Right. And I figured once I got a job down there, then you know I, I could start sending money back to Betty a little at a time. Okay. That never happened, though. It still hasn't. That never, uh, yeah, obviously that never happened. And I'll bring a lot more to light later on about perverted justice and Xavier Von Erk. How you're AKA always. AKA Philip Ede. You're always, you're always promising later on. Um, that's fine. And, uh, well, and we know that. And later you know, on because I can deliver. No, I know. And to your, and to your credit, and this is not, you know, coming to the defense of pedophiles or doing anything else, but, you know, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Because if you want it now, I can dig it right out. 
No, this is not about that. This is not about it. This is not this is not about exposing perverted justice. This is about you. Um, you know, I I I don't want it to take that course. After all of this went down, Ember got the full unedited interview tapes from Lorne, as Lorne was giving those tapes to aid in his lawsuit. Lorne noticed new things about him were released on the internet, like the phone calls between him and Ember, but because he isn't good at using computers or technology, Ember could just say that she was hacked or something along those lines and get away with it. Lorne would also continue to do several interviews, answer questions that people wanted answered, and even created a YouTube channel to really cash in on this internet fame. Nathaniel, however, went a darker path. He started to shift his Lorne content from analytical videos to videos of him making fun of Lorne's family. He openly promoted the harassment of Lorne. He used his website to scam his viewers. He started to impersonate some members in the community, and he tried to take credit for some of Ember's calls. This really started to shake up the community. First was Bay Shaman, who held the stance that Lorne's employers and family shouldn't be harassed and that they should be left out of this. This was an unpopular opinion to have at the time, and due to the backlash, he shifted his content away from Lorne and quietly left the community. Nathaniel didn't stop there. He then started going after Ember, making derogatory videos about her, calling CPS on her, trying to get her fired from her job, and possibly going even farther. This led to Ember taking a hiatus from the community. Nathaniel was the only one left, but he wouldn't be staying for long. Someone gave Nathaniel a taste of his own medicine, and he was faced with a person who had his personal information. Afraid of being doxxed, Nathaniel leaves the community as well. A very interesting story, and one that really shaped this Church of Cod community. It's also a story that's completely wiped from the internet. That Church of Cod website Nathaniel made? Completely gone. All of his videos? Yep, gone too. Well, other than sparse re-uploads. That Church of Cod Facebook page? I think this is it? It goes back pretty far, but I'm not sure. Nathaniel's book about Lorne? By the way, Nathaniel made a book about Lorne. Gone. This drama is just a distant memory, as it probably should be. Hello everybody, this is Honky Magoo again. Now if you've been following my weird little uploads tonight, you probably guess there's been some dialogue between myself and Nathaniel. Um, I don't want to go too deep into what it was, but he has agreed to comply with some of my, in fact he's already complied with my perfectly reasonable demands. Um, I'm going to honor my end of the deal as well. Um, that being said, I am going to be putting my project on indefinite hiatus. I'm not completely canceling it because he could always go ape shit and go back on his word. He's done it before. But I, I do think this time it's probably over. And I think it's in the best interest of everybody involved for me to not pursue this. I do have two other videos made. I was planning on making two more. But I, I, I think hopefully this can be the end of this. And that, that's really what I wanted. Was My whole goal here was to get enough leverage to make him stop you know, doing what he was doing. So. But I'm not going to get too much further into that. I'm just going to say that, you know, I want to thank you guys for supporting me. I want to thank Pornography for being hilarious throughout the years here, but uh, looks like with Lorne having lost his magic and the mind and the thing of war here ending, it looks like um, I will be leaving the community for good, so if you don't hear from me again, that means Nathaniel's not being a dick, and everything's cool. So, uh, thanks everyone for everything. And, uh, I will maybe talk to you guys in the future. Have a great night, everyone. Honky is out. Alright, time to get back into the swing of things now that Nathaniel is gone. Things ran pretty smoothly after he left. Ember came out of hiatus and continued to catfish Lorne, record the calls, and started growing a team that would participate with catfishing Lorne by providing different voices for different characters. People started live streaming the calls, which just made the community grow even more. 
Yep, everything is going mighty well for this community. Oh, so this Jordan comedy guy came into this community and started acting inappropriate with a lot of people. Oh, so Emperor has had a history of doing some not okay stuff like false flagging and using her large status in the community to basically get her way. Alright, alright, this Church of Cog community has had some more dramas after Nathaniel's passing, and both of them have been covered in depth by your boy, Wes Most. So I'm not going to delve into them. Instead, I want to spend the rest of this video discussing the good that the community has done, since that isn't done enough. Of course, the first thing we have to talk about is the massive amount of money this community has raised. Let's start with Betty, who has been interacting even more with the community ever since her interview in 2016. Remember when I said that Ember never stopped catfishing Lorne? Well, the phone calls that Ember and Lauren had, as well as other characters that were brought in, were all kept inside of a folder called The Dump, which stored not only the Lauren calls, but voicemails, pictures, and much more. It was then Ember's idea to start charging $25 for access to this folder collection, and with the help of Clobbering Time, a well-known TCAP streamer who used his channel to collect donations for Betty, as well as advertise The Dump, the community was able to raise around $32,000 for Betty, more money than Lauren owed her, and more money than he'll ever pay back. Just as a warning, uh, Winnie and I are going to be talking over this entire fucking thing, and we're probably going to be stopping it a whole lot, a whole lot. So uh, if you want to hear this call or any other calls in their entirety without us talking, in the description, there is a link, uh, not a link, but a, the information on the donations for Betty. Because essentially, uh, what this is, is, is nothing more than a commercial for uh, the fundraiser for Betty. Uh, there's hours upon hours of uh, Lorne material available that uh, mm -hmm. you can get for just a donation to Betty. So, uh, you know, this is a good... A good cause. This is we're you know we're this is uh we're we're trying to help Betty out right now. So absolutely, this is all for Betty. That's right. That's right. Because we love her. <laughs> Speaking of clobbering time, he has also held donations for the Center of Missing and Exploited Children and the Polaroids Project, as well as held donations with your boy Wes Most while talking about Muse. These streams, as you can see have been quite successful, and what they, as well as this community have done, is quite the accomplishment. Whether you like this little community or not, think it's a little bit weird, you must admit, they do some pretty good stuff. So is that it? I mean, this is the end, right? The tale of a man who started to bite off more than he can chew, caught doing something he thought he could get away with, now to serve his days stuck in Maine while he endlessly thinks about what he has done. While in prison, a small group formed that analyzed and mocked the predators exposed, and within that group, Lorne exploded to an extreme degree, to the point where he has a whole community based solely on him. Now, it's 2021, and the Lauren Armstrong community is still going. Although the name, the Church of Cod, isn't used as much anymore, many people still make, stream, and discuss content revolving around Lorne. As the 14th anniversary of Lorne's arrest, as well as Lorne's 53rd birthday approaches, the community is in high spirits, ready to celebrate the big day. Of course, we both know that this isn't the end. In fact, for some people, this is only the beginning. There's still one question we haven't answered yet. A very big question. What happened in those phone calls? You know, those phone calls that Ember and Lawrence started all so long ago. And those same phone calls that raised so much for Betty. Well, the answer is very complicated. 
But once Ember contacted Lorne in March of 2006, a new world was created. A world that revolves completely around Lorne, with characters who are more than just interesting, and events that don't even seem real. At first, it was just Lorne and Emma, but soon the roster of characters grew larger and larger, and the stories became crazier and crazier. So crazy that it becomes hard to follow. Who is who? Where are we? What year is it? Is there even a story here, or is there just a collection of unrelated calls that don't lead into one another? So many questions, gone unanswered for so long, but it's finally time to complete the story. Stay tuned, because now a legacy is born.